That's it. Okay, so we've been working our way through uh, Dr. Peterson's three best examples of intermediate forms that he had in his book, Evolution. Um, we got to Archaeopteryx, and it's kind of a pathetic example of an intermediate form for the reasons that we discussed. Um, even devout evolutionists recognize that it is uh, fully bird. It does have some uh, reptilian, I guess you could say, features on it. The skull is attached uh, to the vertebrae at the back. Um, doesn't have much of a strong keel bone and tends to things like that. But it does have air sacs, at least two air sacs. Um, most birds, most modern birds have five. But we recognize that it was a strong flyer and um, kind of sucks as an intermediate form, especially because we find it in layers higher than uh, modern birds. So they've had to look for other intermediate forms between birds and reptiles, and uh, one of them turned out to be an absolute hoax. Um, this guy, this was Archaeoraptor. It's hard to see that uh, term there. You can do your own research on this, but um, basically National Geographic had to come out and recant their original stance on Archaeoraptor because it was an outright hoax. And it was one of those things that, you know, probably half of you guys could have looked at it and been like, I don't think so. <laughs> so what even a good one? Yeah, a lot of these hoaxes are not really that great. But, and we talk about Piltdown Man and Nebraska Man and some of those, and you just kind of shake your head like, really? They're that desperate? <laughs> um, they're still adamant that some dinosaurs had feathers. They're absolutely adamant about that. Um, I've looked at their evidence. And basically, dinosaurs had hair. And they're absolutely adamant that those hairs are feathers. And there were feathered dinosaurs. And just get over it. And I'm like, that looks an awful lot like hair to me. I, well, we need, definitely need a, more data on that. And there's embryological evidence that scales are actually devolved feathers. If you take a feather gene and you mutate it, what you get is a scale, and that's why birds have scales on their legs, is because they start out as feathers and then something weird happens to them and they end up being scales. So, only unfortunately, do what? Only on their legs. Yeah, they only, have, only on their legs. So. <laughs> Don't ask me, I didn't design the thing, I just, um, I just report the evidence. So I think they'll be really embarrassed if they figure out that um, they got the whole evolution thing backwards and feathers came before scales. and. Stuff like that would be really embarrassing for them. I, I will uh, get a lot of entertainment value out of that. So, uh, the last of Dr. Peterson's, I'm sorry, Patterson's um, missing links, the last of his three. Remember, the first one was up here. Rhino thing is actually almost identical to a modern Hyrax. Uh, then he had Archaeopteryx. And the third example that he provides in his book is the link between fishes and amphibians. And I was very surprised to learn that because I don't hear that a lot from evolutionists. I'll be honest with you. They don't talk about it much. And without getting into too much of the anatomical evidence, um, first of all, some of these transitional forms are known from like one or two bones. That, that's it. They found a piece of his jaw. Oh, it's a transitional form between fish and amphibian. And I'll be honest with you, I think that's a little bit shady. I mean, okay, maybe you can tell that from its jaw. I, I doubt it though. I got my doubts. Just saying, I'm a little skeptical. Um, the others are more, okay, maybe I can see why you would think that, that, that this could be a transitional form. Um, what it boils down to as evidence is that these creatures have lungs and gills at the same time, which is a characteristic of almost every modern amphibian that they have lungs and gills at the same time. So once again, uh, you don't hear a lot of evolutionists talking about it because we have modern animals that do the exact same thing. Uh, so well, you're, okay, you're saying these are transitional forms because these guys happen to be perfectly modern amphibians. Um, and I'll just go ahead and say right now, I think that trying to try, you're trying to convince me that amphibian is a transitional form. It's got the genes for both organisms. It has genes for gills and genes for lungs. It's twice as complicated to ev evolve an amphibian as it would be either a fish or a reptile. Um, we'll talk more about that when we get to uh, genetics. But you can do some research on here. This is from Top Origins. 
Um, or it's, a, it's a reaction to, I should say, the Top Origins um, web page. Be careful what you read on there. They're um, not, well, people just aren't always honest. And creationists as well are not always honest. You've got to do your own homework sometimes. Now, we've got other intermediate forms we're going to be looking at besides the ones that Dr. Patterson uh, talked about. We're going to get into some of the uh, alleged ape men. That's why I'm wearing my unevolved t shirt. It's just men all the way across. Okay, probably because, and, and there's only men up here because naked women are just not appropriate to put on t shirts. <laughs> anyway, so it's important to realize that most of the links in the fossil record are still missing. The oldest fossil bat, as we have seen, is a bat. No kidding. The, uh, the, uh, there's no transitional forms leading up to the vertebrates. We don't see a backbone evolving over millions of years. It's just no backbones, no backbones, no backbones. There they are! Wow, it's amazing. Uh, many mammals disappear suddenly in the fossil record. Uh, woody plants, sharks, whales, they all appear suddenly with no transitional forms whatsoever. And uh, every once in a while, they come up with a whale. Oh, look, it's evolving into a... Oh, never mind, it's Mandy. <laughs> so they get, they, get, they get pretty excited about some of this stuff. And it's, it's just a question of, okay, what, how are they looking at the evidence? If I'm looking at the evidence, it's not very impressive. Okay, so it's important that we realize, you know, you see those transitional form charts in the biology textbooks, and there's like all of these little stages, and you're like, okay, so they have a lot of evidence. Every single bone that supposedly came from an intermediate form or a common ancestor between apes and humans could fit inside a single coffin. We are not talking about a lot of evidence here, which is kind of ironic considering that humans are supposed to have been evolving for millions of years now, and there should have been, lived and died, hundreds of thousands of these things, and they're much more recent than the other guys, so if they did form fossils, we should be able to find them more easily, and we just don't. But basically, um, most, of the, most of the fossils fall into one of three categories. We're going to go over the, uh, the uh, categories here. The first one is Lucy. Okay, Lucy is supposed to be the ape that walked, and she did all this stuff that apes are not supposed to do, and, and so on and so forth. Um, they have, uh, this is Australopithecus afarensis, and there's lots of Australopithecines, okay? They all fall into this group. They'll try to make it sound like they have lots and lots of different transitional forms. Basically, they're all the same kind of critter. They make them into different species, but there's not a lot of difference between the Australopithecines, okay? Uh, this is more commonly known as Lucy. It's a very small skeleton, and we have about 40% of it. The original skeleton of Lucy, we did not have any feet, uh, and we only had one wrist. Okay. The pelvis, unfortunately, had been crushed. So, not that much evidence, but a very complete skeleton as far as fossils are concerned. So it's impressive from a fossil perspective. You might look at it and be like, wow, that's your whole worldview right there? You're basing your whole worldview off that. Um, it is a very complete skeleton. Uh, unfortunately, uh, everything about her is ape. If you look at the interior structure of her ear, they have those bones, and it's very obvious that she had ape balance and not human balance. It's actually more difficult to walk on two legs than you might think, and if you've taught uh, babies to walk, you can kind of maybe appreciate that a little bit more. It requires very uh, sophisticated structures on your inner ear that help you balance. Lucy did not have these, okay? Um, we studied her wrist bone. She had wrists like an ape. It's very obvious from a study of her wrist bone that she was a knuckle walker. We studied her collarbone. The collarbone in an ape is low bearing because okay, they actually support their whole weight off of their arms. Okay, humans can't do that for very long. Um, the collarbone seems to be it. It seems to be, no, it seems to be low bearing. Um, studying her knee. Uh, well, they got all excited about studying her knee. Oh yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of human-like. Um, there's not a lot of difference between ape knees and human knees. 
It's a knee. A horse knee is about, about the same as an elephant knee. A knee is, is kind of like a knee, okay? Um, they, uh, the only thing, after studying her more carefully, the only thing that um, might be ape-like, or I'm sorry, might be human-like is her pelvis. Remember I said her pelvis was crushed. Well, if you reconstruct her pelvis a certain way, the iliac bones are like flattened, or I forget which orientation they have, but in apes they're one way, and in humans they're another way. And if you put it back together one way, it looks like a human pelvis. If you put it back together the way that we actually found it, it's like an ape pelvis, okay? Now, <clears throat> they got all excited about Lucy. She was in all the press. They made a video about her. Um, taught, they, they, they showed it in like every single public school on earth. They were so excited, they finally found missing links between apes and humans, so finally shut those stupid creationists up. And unfortunately, they found more examples of Lucy that have more evidence. Okay, so then science happened. Um, she has curved finger bones, right? Your finger bones are straight. Gives you, gives you certain capabilities that apes don't have. Um, and apes' finger bones are curved. Every bone is curved in an ape's hand so that they can grab onto a branch, okay? Lucy's, when we found other uh, examples of Lucy, or I should say Australopithecus, all of the other examples have curved finger bones. Um, Lucy did not have feet. That's one, of, that's one major difference between apes and humans is our feet, right? Apes have a, a uh, well, a hand, if you will, for a foot. Um, and they have an opposable thumb, opposable big toe, I guess you could say, on their foot. So their foot structure is radically different from, from ours. So when they first drew pictures of Lucy, they put human feet on her. <laughs> Even though they didn't have any, any feet in the uh, original find. Uh, other examples of Australopithecus have very good feet and they're all eight feet. So sorry. So you don't hear a lot about Lucy um, because, because of uh, a lot of... Uh, the unfortunate things they've discovered about her since the original discovery. Um, the guy that dug her up does not consider her to be an intermediate form at all. And he is a devout evolutionist. Later on in his life, he had a little bit of a falling out with evolution. And we'll, when we watch this video, we'll, uh, we'll see more of that. We may get to that this, uh, this week. We'll see. It is important for us to realize that all other supposed intermediate forms fall into one of two categories. Okay. You may have been led to believe that there were dozens. There are not. There are only three. Their Australopithecines are obviously ape. Even the guys that discovered them um, admitted that, right? I say admitted, promote that idea that they're apes. Okay. Um, there are two other groups, one being the Homo erectus and the other being Neanderthals. Now, both of these groups came about right after Darwin published his book. And he was like, all right, we don't have any intermediate forms, so you guys go out and find them. And everybody in Europe got all excited, and they went on all these crusades to find human fossils that weren't quite human, or ape fossils that were more advanced, and all that stuff. Okay? And they found Java Man, 1470s skull, and Carcana Boy, and they found Cro-Magnon. Cro-Magnon is a modern human, they found Neanderthal. Neanderthal has a larger brain capacity than the average human. Um, Homo erectus had a larger, uh, a taller average height, six and a half feet tall, even after they're fossilized. Um, so unfortunately, all of these guys are obviously human, 100% human, maybe even had a little bit more horsepower running around upstairs than, uh, than we do, on average, okay? Uh, all, uh, especially Cro-Magnon, all of, the, of those examples have larger than average height and brain capacity. 16 to 1700 cubic centimeters versus an average of 1440 for modern human. Interestingly enough, we have really not linked intelligence to brain capacity. And I have an enormous head. I really do. I tell people I have, my skull is four inches thick. I'm not trying to brag. It's just, it's just fact. Um, funny, funny story here. Okay, so I worked uh, masonry for many years. And um, I worked on a crew, and I was, I was the tallest guy on the crew, except for this really tall guy that was not that big around. So nobody messed with me, which is a good thing. And um, but we had this one lift driver who was Native American, 
and uh, he was just one of these guys that all, you couldn't tell him anything, right? He knew it all, and uh, he just kind of got his way. He was really good, though, so we put up with him. And he, he went around one time, and he was trying on everybody's hard hat, right? Because you have it, you have it adjustable, right? And so he like put it on people's hard hat. Man, you got a tiny little head, you little pinhead, you know? Kind of, kind of a bully, you know? And, and he went around and kind of teasing all these guys. And I, and I was the last guy in the row, sitting on the row, and I was like, oh yes, this is gonna be so sweet. I'm just gonna sit here, pretend like nothing's gonna happen. And he comes along, he comes along, and I'm just kind of looking at the guys like, hey, you guys better pay attention, it's gonna be hilarious. And he gets to my hard hat and puts it on, comes right down over his eyes. And, uh, dang, Carter, why don't you got a big head? I do, I have an enormous head, but we've, we haven't really linked um, skull, or, uh, skull capacity to intelligence in you humans anyway. Smart, well, I had great teachers. Whatever I, whatever I am, I owe I to my teachers. So anyway, all of these guys are clearly humans. Tarkana boy, actually, is a very interesting study. They originally thought he was a teenager. They did some more studies on him and uh, figured out that he's uh, probably only nine years old. The, guy, the, the, the skeleton is like five foot six. So again, um, maybe we used to be bigger back then. We've read that thing before. You might have it. Yeah. Well, and in, in other uh, fossils, a lot of the other fossils we find, you know, an armadillo, nine times current armadillo size, we find um, uh, ground sloth, 20 feet tall, reached 800 pounds. There's a fossil rhinoceros um, that reached possibly 45,000 pounds, 16 feet tall at the shoulder. So uh, it seems like everything was bigger back then, and it might have included humans. Remember I talked about, okay, my cubit's 19 and a half inches long, but if you got yourself a bigger human, you got a bigger cubit. See what I'm saying? Maybe that's why the Egyptian cubit is like 30 some odd inches, or 28 inches, I figure what it is. Um, so anyway, I won't get too much into that because the video deals with a lot of it, and I don't want to, you know, um, spoil that. Dr. Don Patton does an absolutely amazing job going over all this evidence. Okay, we're going to talk a little bit about humans in the fossil record. We don't find a lot of human fossils, okay? We do find a few. Um, Alakite man is a good example of that, but they're very rare. Human fossils are incredibly rare. And in my research, I've found a lot of really unsubstantiated stories. It's like, oh yeah, my grandmother told me about this one time, they went down in this cave, they found this thing, it was really cool. Ah, I don't put a lot of credence in that, but I think it's interesting, so we'll look at some of the, I don't know, more credible examples. Um, again, this is probably more of the Bigfoot-like story uh, about human giants. This is a legend, he's almost making him scroll past him. Uh, let's see. Uh, this guy's talking about his grand grandmother tells again. Okay, this is like one of those big just so stories, one of those bigfoot stories, one of those fish stories. So he's talking about her great grandfather. Oh yes, your great grandfather was a giant. Oh, you mean my grandpa? No, he, yeah, he was six and a half feet tall. No, I'm talking about your great grandfather. He was much taller, apparently. But uh, he was told that his great grandfather was seven feet tall or more, could grab people by their head <laughs> with one hand. His fingertips resting on their eyebrows and his palm on the base of their skull, so he could wrap his head all the way around your skull. I bet he couldn't do that to me. Um, <laughs> my mother reports that his ears were six and seven inches from top to bottom. He had a horse six feet high, the back could be seen over the saddle from the shoulders up. Hmm. Yeah, how, how much credence do you put in that? I don't know. Uh, there, is, there is a legend about, um, and this is, this is, that's what I would call this legends. We don't have literally a written historical reference for them. The science community has kind of a different story related to this, so who do you trust? I don't really trust any, any of them as far as I can tell them, so I'm just going to mention it just, just because I think it's cool. Um, in Nevada, this guy heard stories of the, uh, from the Powhite Indians. Uh, they told a red-haired men and women of light-colored skin, 12 feet tall, who originally lived in the area when the Powhites first arrived. Where did the Powhites come from? They came from Asia, right? All of the natives, Native uh, American tribes originally came from Asia. So they crossed over the land bridge 
Apparently, when they got here, there were already people here who were giants. Does that sound familiar? That's very similar to Norse, Norse mythology, right? Oh yeah, when we got here, there were ice giants. And the ice giants attacked us, and they liked to eat us, and we decided we, we didn't like them. And so one of our great leaders uh, rounded all of us up, united us under one front, and we kicked their butts, and there are no more ice giants. With the help of the gods, right? Hmm. So it's kind of, kind of eerily similar here. Um, so, uh, eventually, evidently these guys like to eat the Indians. They had problems making friends. No kidding. That would be a deal breaker for me. Uh, now, you ate my uncle, huh? You're toast, pal. Even if you are 12 feet tall. The Indian tribes of the area finally joined together, ambushed the giants, killed most of them. Uh, they were impossible to miss, right? <laughs> uh, David found that out with Goliath. The remaining giants took refuge in a cave. Never fight in the basement, never fight in the cave. Remember that. <laughs> There's a picture on the, um, the internet. I think it's in a, some kind of a drill sergeant like or a boot camp type thing. There's a picture of a Marine throwing a grenade downstairs. Never fight in the basement. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you don't want to do that. That's a bad idea. <laughs> uh, so they took refuge in the cave. Not the smartest move. Uh, the Indians to come out and fight like, like giants. <laughs> and they refuse. So the Indians, uh, well, we're going to burn them out. Um, any giants that run out were shot with arrows, many giants were asphyxiated. Apparently in the 1800s, the cave was known as Horseshoe Cave, is now called the Lovelock Cave, 20 miles south of Lovelock, Nevada. I'd love to go there and dig around a little bit, see what I can find. 1911, back guano harvesters. Now, there is a job worse than working in fast food. <laughs> we're harvesting bat poop. Yeah, ladies. First of all, you should be buying makeup anyway, because there's nobody in here that needs makeup. Um, I have I have met two ugly women in my life. Lord help me, she was both of them. Um, but anyway, <laughs> she couldn't be helped. Trust me on this. I don't know why makeup is a thing. Um, but some makeup has bat poop in it. So just because it says all natural on the label, doesn't mean it doesn't have bat turds in it. <laughs> It's natural. <laughs> so is lead, mercury, and I don't know, polonium. Does make it doesn't, does not mean that it's good. Anyway, so they dig around in bat poop. They dug out four feet of bat poop, and they found a lot of broken arrows. And the Indians fired in the cave, as well as other artifacts, and they found red-haired giants. Interesting. Uh, again, this would be theoretically a whole different gene pool than those that came from Asia. We would assume. Uh, even in a shrunk, shrunken, mummified condition, you take all the water out of yourself, you're going to shrink a little bit. Uh, the skeletons range in height from 8 feet to just under 12. Yeah, if you look it up on uh, Wikipedia, they say 6.5 to 8. Um, this is still way above average height. Okay. Remember, Americans are taller on average because we have unbelievable nutrition, right? The biggest problem facing poor people in America is obesity, right? We have ungodly amounts of food around here. Um, average height, average height for a female in the world is five foot two. I'm... I know, right? You didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> average height for a male, I think, is five five, maybe five six. Wow. So my dad is actually average height. I always thought of him as being short, he's five foot six. Mm -hmm. And uh, I always wanted to be six feet tall. I'm, I'm five foot eleven and a half. Oh, my Don't God. admit. I won't admit it. I'll never admit it. Oh, it's on video, I guess. Now, um, so, uh, okay, so eight feet tall, let's just say they're eight, they were eight feet tall. That's a giant. Not like the giants that Hollywood has tried to sell us over the years. We're talking about giants as they were historically known. Uh, if you were over six and a half feet tall, you were called a giant. And somebody that had to duck to get in that door, you'd probably call them a giant too. You just probably haven't met anybody that tall. <laughs> Have you seen the, the pictures? I think it's uh, Shaquille O'Neal standing next to one of those the late night comedian guys. Yeah. And the late night comedian guy is, is wearing his jacket, and the jacket comes like almost all the way down to the floor. And he's just sitting there like, this is ridiculous! But it's hilarious, I'll do it for TV. Uh, apparently, this is one of the jaws that they recovered. Um, again, I, I've never actually handled it, just mentioning it here. Two giant skeletons. 
wrapped in a gum treated fabric. One is eight feet tall. So he's got several stories here that are really not very well substantiated, right? Not a lot of stuff you can just go out and, okay, can we verify his data? Not really. Can you go to that cave now? I mean, is it. I assume you could. Wonder if it's on private property or. I have no idea. I think we should make it a school out. Yeah, field let's go to take like a field trip. Field trip. Everybody, bring a, everybody bring a shovel and some dust masks because we're going to be digging around in back poo. Uh, let's see, size of the bones. The owner of the bone was stood over 12 feet tall. Yeah, that is a really big old corn fed country boy. Uh, the legends. Now, this one I have been able to kind of verify the legend in other places, again, on the internet. So it must on the internet. It must be true, right? Right. Um, islands of Hawaii heard about red haired giants. Hmm. Common theme there, at least in his. Now, how do they, if all they find is a skeleton, how do they know that they're red hair? Uh, the, the Indians actually were not just skeletons. Okay. The hair was actually preserved. Believe it or not, bat poop is a pretty good preservative, which is why they put it in makeup. I would not put that stuff on my face. Sorry. Uh, even if it did preserve my face. I don't want to preserve my face. I'll get a new one. Anyway, um, so uh, we found, uh, they found in the cave in a lot. Oh, yeah, someplace in Hawaii. Uh, apparently, they uh, didn't let him go there. They saw some petroglyphs on the side of a rock pumping. He got a white SUV. They told him to leave. <laughs> she would not tell me the exact measurements. Anyway, um, should be noted that uh, Paley started out as a physical Paley. Right? They made him into a god eventually, and apparently she is described as an extremely tall, fiery red hair, incredible beauty, and she does things that are not very nice. She uh, apparently uh, had a thing for cannibalism. The giants of Peru. Okay, this is an actual human skull that's been wrapped. These also. There's some pictures of really big people compared to average sized people. Uh, this is not an actual bone. This is a cast. Uh, they think it's, uh, let's see, measured to be 47 point and a quarter inches at Blanco Fossil Museum in Texas. Uh, he sculpted it. So this is a sculpture based on their measurement. We don't have any original evidence. So again, Really sure how reliable it is. There's a National Geographic photo. And Asians are not known to be overly tall. Mm -hmm. I think there's one in the uh, NBA. Yeah, me. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so that's kind of kind of what we're looking at. Okay, um, there seems to be some evidence that humans used to be bigger in the past, and we'll talk a little bit more about that when we get to the Nephilim. Uh, almost all human fossils probably come from rocks that were laid down after the flood. Again, I wasn't there. I didn't measure them. Um, Malachi family being a, 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 a um, ex exception to that rule. Now, why did you, you said that human fossils are very rarely found. Why is that? Good question. Don't know. Um, we'll, we'll talk about some possibilities over here in just a second. Okay. So, we, we don't find human fossils in the lower levels of the fossil layer. Not really surprising, right? Um, humans living at the time of the flood have been listening to Noah rant and rave about this thing he calls rain and judgment and <laughs> power of God and all that stuff. And people back then never denied God's existence. They knew exactly who God was. They were openly rebelling against him, which I think is the main reason God wiped him out. Um, because they, they, they were completely without excuse. They were without excuse. Those people could talk directly to Adam. Okay, There's no denying that um, you know, history. He's, he's the only one there. He's the oldest of us. So, um, so at the first sign of the flood, again, especially according to hydroplane theory, while hell breaks loose, they are definitely going to head for high ground and therefore would not have been fossilized. Okay? Um, it is also possible that some of them survived the flood. What? 
Oh, now you're committing heresy, Mr. Cartwright, because the Bible clearly says that every living thing had been destroyed. Yes, and we understand that that means that there were still lots of living things on the earth, including bacteria, including Noah and his family. Um, I think that's probably just describing the world that Noah came back to. There was nothing living there. But there were living things on the earth. We, we know that the whales didn't all die out, right? And they're living things. So it's not talking about that the entire earth has been sterilized and we only have what's in the arguments, and that's it. That's not what it's talking about. It must be talking about something else. Um, by the way, and this is just a cursory overview, but every culture I have studied that could make iron and bronze had ships also. I have done some smelting in my day, mostly lead, but some aluminum, and I can tell you it's extremely difficult to do, and I'd rather build a boat. I think building a boat would be easier than being able to smelt these things, okay? Um, so if they had ships, it is perfectly possible that some of them survived. Possible. And actually, I'm going to say that the Bible says that some of them survived. We'll, we'll talk about that in just a second. Um, some of the accounts of the ancient giants seem kind of accurate. Again, we have stories in the Bible. Oh, we're like grasshoppers next to these people. <laughs> we don't stand a chance. They're just going to you know, drop kick us into the next county. Ah, we're screwed. Um, so, yeah, we have some accounts from the scriptures. Uh, you know, David's slaying uh, the giant Goliath and, and others. There's other, other mentions of giants in the Bible. Uh, but others, especially once you get outside the scriptures, are a lot pretty similar to modern big stories. Oh yeah, we were out in the woods, and this thing came up, and it was huge! And it smelled awful! Look, we ran away and hid, and it ate our dog, you know? Uh -huh. um, so, uh, however, just like with the dragons, every culture seems to have legends about giants. And it's just kind of like, okay, they all seem to think that when they got to this place, there used to be giants. We killed them all off because there were way more of us than there were of them. And all of them seem to be cannibalistic. Well, if you have to survive on a boat for 300 days, making an unplanned trip, okay, if you can survive the conditions of the flood, what's probably going to happen? You're going to run out of food. In America, cannibalism is like the most horrific unthinkable evil that there is. And it is evil, I'm not trying to say that it's not. But in other places of the world, it's a lot more common than you might think. Okay? Um, as a matter of fact, the Japanese practiced cannibalism during World War II. We have lots of evidence for that, unfortunately. They don't teach you it in school, because the Japanese are our allies. They should teach it to you in school to say, hey, look how far these guys came. In, in one generation, they've come, they're a world power again after we destroyed everything. And look what they used to do. Anyway, so, so yeah, they, they ate each other. There weren't very many of them left. They had a very small gene pool, probably lived very long periods of time. And so when uh, humans got there, they were defeated after a couple of battles, pretty much. Uh, they have loose morals, go figure. They survived the flood. They rebelled against God, all right? There are some stories of good giants, but almost all of them are bad. Again, kind of weird, isn't it? Why are all the giants in the stories bad? Some of them, uh, some of them are um, cyclopses. They only have one eye. Hmm. Some of them have two heads. These are signs of uh, a very thin genetic code, isn't it? Their genetic code's been messed up. They went, you know, there were this many of them. This many of them survived the flood, and offspring. Yeah, their offspring are kind of weird. Anyway, um, Hercules is the only example I can find of a good giant. I could not find any others. Our scripture has several references to giants, David and Goliath. Uh, perhaps the next most famous is the Nephilim. Now, who were the Nephilim? I don't know. 
apparently a few of these demon giants survived the flood. Because the scripture says that the Nephilim were on the earth in those days. What does it mean in those days? The days of Noah. It says the Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward. Did you ever read that part of scripture and go, what? The Nephilim were on the earth after the flood? Hmm. Maybe that's why God told the children of Israel to wipe the Canaanites off the face of the earth. Maybe they were left over. Uh... Not too long. Maybe that's why they were so evil. Sacrificing their children in fires and stuff. Because they got demon DNA, man. That would, that would, that would ruin anybody's day, I think. <laughs> um, you can check it out. Demon mythology, there's, there's dozens and dozens of examples. Where is that we can at do. Oh, why don't we find out? Nothing like reading it straight from the scripture. I should have put the quote in there. Beep. Well, music mode. For the love of Pete, get out of my face. Alright, here we go. Let's see if I can spell it correctly. Got it. No, <laughs> I don't think he knows that word. Beep. Ah ha ha! Nephilim. Sorry. No T in there. <laughs> the Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward. The sons of God went to the daughters of humans and had children by them. They were the heroes of old, the men of renown. And of course, if we go to the context of Genesis chapter 6, we're talking about the wickedness of the human race. So we're setting it up. Oh, not the whole chapter. Come on. Lord had granted, and he said, I'll wipe the face. So he's talking about the, the days of Noah, right? The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward. Hmm. It is very possible that Genesis was written from notes that Noah took. Very possible. And if he took notes, apparently he knew how high the mountains were covered, right? We have that number. The mountains were covered to a certain depth. So if he's taking notes, and he gets off the ark and he says, wow, every living thing is destroyed. And somebody says, yeah, the Nephilim, Nephilim were on the earth in those days. Somebody comes along and says, oh yeah, there were a couple of them left over after the flood. We discovered them later on. Noah didn't know about them, but we figured it out. What if somebody stuck this in here and said, hey, we have Nephilim that were left over after the flood. We've we wiped them all out by now. But there were, there were giants on the earth in those days. Uh, God says, I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race that I have created. And with them, the animals, birds, and creatures move along the ground, for I regret that I have made them. That could be one reason why we don't find many human fossils. God says he's going to wipe them out. Could be that there weren't that many humans. Humans like to build cities on top of hills for fortification purposes. We do find some, though. We're going to look at a couple more examples here. Uh, there are human artifacts that are possibly more common than fossils. Um, this is a bell that was found in a lump of coal. The um, Kneeling posture, you got wings on the side here. Looks like a little demon thing. Looks like one of those monkeys that does <laughs> <the same> <laughs> <thing>. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, let's see. The guy that found it um, did 
did take a polygraph test. You can check out the report there if you'd like. Or the Wizard of Oz. Yeah, the way it looks like the Wizard of Oz. Those flying monkey yeah. things? Yeah. Um, apparently this was found in a lump of coal that's supposed to be 300 million years old. Well, <laughs> uh, so that's that's one of the one of the more well known examples. Um, of course, the Cretaceous hammer. Now, this hammer is, is very interesting for a couple of reasons. Um, first of all, the it is embedded in a rock that is apparently very old. Now. The scientists didn't get to see it actually embedded in the layer, the Cretaceous layer, um, but it does seem to come from that area. Um, the alloy that the hammer is made of is not one that we currently make. In fact, it shouldn't be possible to make an alloy like this. You can see the little nick here where they took a sample from it. The wood of the handle is partially coalified. You can see that up close there. What does that mean? Um, partially, partially been turned into coal. Oh. Which normally would require at least a significant amount of time. Um, I don't know that you could, I guess you could argue that it's a modern example. Uh, let's see, it's found in 1934. It chiseled, uh, chiseled open this rock with a piece of wood sticking out, a small portion of the hammer was filed down and confirmed it was, in fact, metal. Over the decades, that little nick in the hammer has not rusted, which is interesting. Uh, the site consists primarily of Cretaceous rock. Masses of shell fossils are found in the same location. Now part of the Creation Evidence Museum, where it's been extensively analyzed. Permineral, the handle is permineralized, which I assume is similar to petrification. It has black and coalified tip. The head is made out of a rare iron mixture with chlorine. We don't normally uh, mix chlorine with iron to make steel these days, but perhaps that was a technology um, way back in the day. Uh, even near the sea, it has proved to be incredibly resistant to erosion. I wonder I'm if sorry, uh, uh, rusty. I wonder if before the flood, if they had certain technology that did not go with them, you know. <laughs> well, I'm sure. I'm sure they. Um, I'm sure we'll never know how advanced the civilization was. If you live to be a thousand years old, I imagine you can learn quite a bit. Um, I've met some humans who have been students all their lives. It seems to me by the time you're 50 and 60 years old, you can learn a mountain of information. So if you live to be 600, um, maybe you could learn to make an alloy of iron and chlorine, like this guy apparently did. We, uh, we, I like to say, I, I've never heard of any other iron chlorine alloy. And, um, I wouldn't think that it would be possible because chlorine is a non-metal, right? We don't, um, well, and it's, it would be, um, it, would, it would make a salt, right? Like sodium chloride, but that, that's just a white powder. Yeah. Is it possible that the chlorine has to do with the non-rusting? Apparently. So, you know, heavy salt is used in like preserving and... With all yeah, but, and you know, you mix, Salt corrodes steel and iron, right? Right. So, so there seems to be some, you know, it's an enigma, right? We're not quite, quite sure what's going on here. We've got metallic iron and chlorine, and they don't tell the uh, composition of it. I think I think we really ought to study it some more. Most people just don't know about it, though. Um, Where is it kept? Do we know? The Creation Evidence Museum, which is in Texas, I believe. We could come right here. I've been. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> the video tape will stay here. <laughs> uh, I guess if I couldn't be from Oklahoma, I'd have to be from Texas, right? Um, this is a, is a video about it if you want to learn more about the Cretaceous hammer. All right, we got to move on. Uh, in my opinion, the most damaging evidence to evolution is not the fossils. 
I think I've made a pretty good case that the fossils do not uh, lead one to believe in evolution as a theory of origins. Um, I think the stronger, the stronger evidence is in the rocks themselves. Evolution used to teach that layers of rocks formed slowly over millions of years. This is what polluted Darwin's mind. He got mixed up with a couple of bad characters who told him, Ah, oh, yes, Mr. Darwin. Um, don't you know that the rates of accumulation today are very, very slow? And so these layers here, they had to take millions of years. Well, it hadn't had been in millions of years at the time. Um, hundreds of thousands of years. There are people running around. The Earth might be as old as 100,000 years. Oh, freak out. That's a huge number. You're probably wrong. <sighs> That's uniformitarianism. Uniformitarianism says that the present is the key to the past. It has since been rejected by nearly every geologist. We'll talk about why. Um, it, unfortunately, science has not been kind to the idea that everything just keeps going and it's just a static thing. It doesn't change over time appreciably. We have to remember that one of the original two pillars of evolution was the geologic column. An imaginary order of various eras over time. The fact that life forms in these eras were very different from each other was one of two reasons that Darwin extrapolated what he saw in Finches. Oh, these are small changes, and he admitted that. He was actually a halfway decent scientist. He's not the uh, Christian hating demon that some people make him out to be. He did good work. Not great work, but he did good work. Uh, so he said, okay, we got these small changes in Finch Peaks over some period of time. What justification do you have for extrapolating that over the entire history of life? We had two. One of them was that different organisms are found in different layers. I'm about to destroy that pillar in the next 15 minutes. This is what you see in all the textbooks, right? And if this is the only information that you had, you might be pretty convinced that, okay, here in Precambrian rock, you find basically nothing. A couple of bacteria here and there, the occasional worm, which actually I'd be tempted to say is part of the uh, Cambrian rock, but pretty much nothing. In the Cambrian rock, you find trilobites and almost nothing else. Up above that, you find some more complicated shellfish. Here's no shellfish. Mm -hmm. Up above that, you find the plated fish, only in this layer. Up above that, you find shoreline creatures. Above that, Finally, we're getting some amphibians, and then the reptiles, and then the big reptiles, and then the first tiny, tiny, tiny mammals are kind of here with the birds, and then here we are, up at the very top, in the tertiary, right? And this is why they say, go down the Grand Canyon, and that's the perfect cure for any creationist. You'll see these, la these organisms and these layers, and we're laying down on the and it's just obvious that they evolved. Even though we know that most of these are clams, right? I mean, most of what you find in here is clams. And then here is clams, and there is clams. These, there's not so many clams down here, though. No. How long do they say the uh, Grand Canyon took? To form? Yeah. Um, th they don't agree about that at all. It's kind of like the formation of the moon. They're all, you know, biting at each other because um, it's very easy. One of, the, one of them will come up with an explanation, and the others will tell her to tear it apart because it's very easy to prove that he's wrong. Because the Colorado River has to be at flood stage to even remove the sediment at the bottom of the Colorado River. Much less pro provide, provide any erosion. There's almost no rainfall there. Um, the Colorado River is mostly flowing from melt from the Rockies, right? So trying to say that the, Col the uh, Colorado River formed the Grand Canyon is fraught with difficulties. And there have been seven or eight major theories that have been basically torn apart by everybody else who didn't think of it. They don't have a theory for how. I think the river flood, flood. the canyon. I think it was actually yeah, formed after the flood. Um, there's a, there's some evidence that they, you know, when as after the continents rose up and water rushes off of them, you, first of all, it's going to erode massive amounts of the land area. But uh, secondly, you will have these trapped pools of water all over the place. And there were probably there was again there's pretty good evidence for this. You can check it out. Walter Brown's book online. He has a, a whole chapter on it that's very involved, but um, he talks about there's a there's this giant lake that was there, and you can actually see in the um, rock layers where it broke over this dam and washed out the uh, Grand Canyon, probably washed out most of the Grand Canyon in two days, maybe three. 
Because it's very unusual because the Grand Canyon flows through a mountain, not around it. If you've ever noticed what water does, it flows downhill. You're not going to erode up a mountain and down the other side. That's, uh, that's not going to happen. But that's exactly what you see at that particular spot. And so Walter Brown says, well, there was a big lake up here. And when it, you know, something happened and it finally topped the um, dam here, or earthquake, or uh, who knows what happened, but something happened and it broke through. And uh, all this giant volume of water washed out that canyon probably in a couple of days. And then we have this little trickle that's left. We saw a repeat of that in Mount St. Helens, which we'll talk about later on. I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. Okay, so uh, this is what they show in the textbooks. It has almost nothing to do with reality, unfortunately. First of all, it does not exist. <laughs> Nowhere in the world do we find a complete geologic column. If we did, it'd be at least 15 miles thick. Some people say it'd be 100 miles thick. We haven't even drilled that deep into the Earth's crust. So, it is true that we do find different layers and that they generally appear in a particular order, not always. Uh, but the Grand Canyon, their, one of their favorite examples, has four and a half out of the 13 layers. And it only has parts of those layers. It does not have, for example, a complete Cambrian layer. It has part of the Cambrian layer. Hmm. Chart we saw was put together by biologists, not geologists and not by paleontologists. Fossils we see tell something of a different story than the one presented by Darwin and others. Uh, unfortunately, they have not updated their chart to reflect reality. Darwin argued that the missing links would be found and the gaps and the spaces would be filled in over time. Uh, this is not the case. The Cambrian layer, for example, contains fossils of 35 animal phyla. Back when Darwin was kicking, they'd only found a few. Nowadays, we have 35 animal phyla that start at the very bottom layer, 35 out of 40. Nearly all life forms originate in the very bottom layer, makes a mockery of macro evolution most scientists ignore what we call the Cambrian explosion. Uh, some scientists are a little bit more honest than that. I believe there was a gentleman who said, we are actually missing nine-tenths of life history. That would be the first nine-tenths. <laughs> Which is a little bit of a problem. Okay, so we're familiar with the uh, evolutionary tree of life. You've got some kind of uh, um, prokaryotic bacteria. It doesn't even have a nucleus. Is a common ancestor for all living things, and you know it evolved and became multicellular, probably became colonial first, and it branched off and all these different types of organisms. And so, the further back in time you go, the fewer common ancestors you have. And um, <laughs> you have all these different creatures that were formed, and so based on their physical characteristics, some creatures are more related to others. And, you know, you get up here to the primates, and then there's the horses, and the dinosaurs, and the reptiles. And very familiar with the tree of life, right? They have been beating their heads against the wall trying to get this thing to work for decades. They haven't been able to. Um, one of the scientists was uh, actually bemoaning the fact that there is no tree of life. It's more like a shrub. You got these branches going every different direction, and you get up to a certain level of complexity, and then all of a sudden, they have four chambered hearts. And you know, it's just a common characteristic across different phyla. So that's the evolutionary tree of life, and this is what we see in the fossil record. Okay? Uh, we have a very few, and again, talking about rare fossils, we have a very few fossils that are found down here below the Cambrian. Most of them are bacteria. Most of them are cyanobacteria, which is a prokaryotic bacteria that doesn't have a nucleus, but it's perfectly modern. They got bacteria floating around in the ocean today that looks identical to its fossils, except the fossils were about 30% larger. Again. Uh, okay, so, and then look at all the different organisms we find in the very bottom of the Cambrian layer there. Each of these columns represents a phylum. And they continue on for some time, and then a lot of them go extinct. See that? 
Uh, but remember that some of these don't really go extinct. We find modern examples of them. They just don't show up in the fossils for 500 million years or so. Uh, and the vertebrates don't show up until here, right? Plated fish, uh, I think, are the first examples of vertebrates. So we don't see a branching, okay, we have one, and then higher up we have three or four, and then higher up we have six or seven, and we have, you know, maybe an extinction event, we go back down to three. Now, that's not what we see in the fossil record. So this is called the tree of life. We call this the uh, creationist lawn. <laughs> anyway, that's our little term for it. So, unfortunately, um, you, you, you just see gaps in the fossil record. Um, I think you've said this before, but why do the fossils just stop disappearing if they're here today? Well, uh, coelacanth fossils, right? Well, let's just pick on this guy and say this is a coelacanth, which it's not, but let's just say that he is. And he disappears 70 million years ago. Well, I don't think he actually disappeared 70 million years ago. I think he's not fossilized in this area because this area fossilized land creatures. Because they were highest up, they were furthest away from the water. Mammals, for example, can live farthest away from water from any other organism. Um, some of these guys up here got sorted because they were the biggest, strongest, and smartest. They could run farthest away from you know, all hell breaking this. Some of these guys up here got sorted because they were the fattest. The whales, for example. Extremely buoyant. You try burying that in water. Have you tried burying a whale in mud? <laughs> I don't recommend it, but if you do, you'll find out that it doesn't quite work because a whale is very buoyant. Okay? Um, so I don't think that the coelacanth was extinct, is extinct there. Well, I think he's not, he doesn't have his picture made higher up because he doesn't live there. Right? So he gets fossilized down here because that's where he lives. He got buried where he was. And he's not buried up there because well, he doesn't live up there. You wouldn't find, expect to find him in, uh, in a desert, would you? I wouldn't expect to find a coelacanth in a jungle. I'd be very surprised if I did. If I did, I'd probably say, hmm. Somebody went fishing and caught themselves a coelacanth and ate it for lunch, right? I wouldn't say, oh, what's this stuff? Oh, this guy obviously lives here. No, he doesn't live there. So, you know, when the flood happened and buried everything, <coughs> um, most of it got buried where it lived. Uh, some of it got buried where it ran to. And a lot of it did not get buried at all because the waters, um, especially further away from the, um, the eruption, the, uh, the, the creatures got to high ground and never fossil, ever fossilized. They just came floating mats of vegetation, rotting corpses, and all that stuff. So, um, you guys know who Richard Dawkins is? Is he still alive? I think he's still alive. Uh, this is a quote from his book. He published it the year before I was born. We find many fossil organisms already in advanced stage of evolution. Evolution, what do you call it? He's a very English. Very proper Englishman. The very first time they appear, it is though they were just planted there without any evolutionary history. Needless to say, this appearance of sudden planting has delighted the creationists. This guy is antagonistic to any kind of a god. He is a devout atheist. He wrote that in '86. Scorns the idea of a god. Hmm. That's what evolutionists have to say. Um, these guys are complicated from the beginning. Not only do they not have any transitional forms, some of them are unbelievably obviously designed. Uh, for example, trilobites. Trilobites are the first creatures to be, that we find in any numbers in the fossil record and probably have the most advanced eyeballs, I don't even balls, uh, the advanced, most advanced eyesight of any creature that ever lived. Instead of using a gel thing like we use to focus light, they used crystals. Um, according to the math, they had perfect underwater vision. Perfect. Okay. As complicated as our eyes are, the trilobite's eyes are approximately 14 times as complicated, and the math to understand how they focus light was not developed until the 1960s. And here's a little diagram of how they worked this out. We have very good fossils of trilobite eyes. Um, apparently, they have a totally different system from the insects or from us. Yeah, I should say here, the arthropods and us. So they have their own thing. <clears throat> a 
again, with the uniformitarianism, scientists have estimated the rate, rate of deposition in these layers to be uh, 1,500 to 2,700 years per foot. Every single layer is at least a year, at least a year's worth of time. Uh, some say it can take hundreds of thousands of years to lay down an inch again, they all disagree. Every time somebody comes up with a theory, they can, the other one can disapprove it. However, we're about to see that this is a case where facts are twisted in such a way to make them fit, or seem to fit, with philosophy. So, maybe you've heard a story like, I was your son, the fish dies, and it floats up to the top of the water, because it's bloated, right? And then it gradually is, you know, decays, and it sort of sinks to the bottom of the ocean, and is slowly covered by sediments, and is fossilized over millions of years. And if you've ever been to Walmart, you know that that's not true. Because those fish, once they get stuck to the filter, they're gone. They do not, you do not see fossils forming at Walmart. I mean, unless you're talking about humans, right? Um, the fish, the fish don't last very long. They get eaten by their friends, right? They degrade very quickly. Their bones are not very heavily calcified. And, uh, yeah, you cannot form fossils slowly. It's quite impossible. Oh, except unless you're a bivalve. If you're a bivalve, I'll grant you you can form fossils slowly. Because a bivalve shell is calcium carbonate, which is chalk. It's mineral, right? It's mostly uh, rock already. It's easy to fossilize those things, which is probably why 95% of fossilized creatures are bivalves. Uh, but not all fossils are bivalves. We find unmistakable evidence in the fossil record of rapid fossilization. This is uh, a crap ton of fossils of jellyfish. Have you ever seen a jellyfish? Those things are nothing but snot. How do you fossilize snot? Very quickly. They're going to bury these creatures and fossilize them in enough detail that we can identify their species. You're going to have to cover them quick. Uh, by the way, there's a formation of jellyfish fossils in Australia that stretches for many miles and is many meters thick. And uh, the scientist is looking at it, he's an evolutionist, and he's a uniformitarianist, probably doesn't even know the creation exists, and his mind just, ex just, it just blew up. It's gone. <laughs> oh my gosh! These, these fossils had to form up, but look at the size of this deposit! It's huge, it goes for miles over there. You can dig a hole in the ground two miles that way, and you'll hit this humongous, it's a continuous, this whole thing had to form in less than 24 hours. Talking about dozens of cubic miles of rock. Hmm. You ever seen a flood lay down dozens of cubic miles of rock before? One hell of a flood. <laughs> 